Okay, moving on, we're now in part 15 on the biblical understanding of weddings and marriage. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to creationliberty.com, just type in the word wedding or type in the word marriage, M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E, and to the search bar at the top right there, that'll get you over to that book. Or if you're listening by YouTube, there should be a link in the description. You can click on that. You'll just have to scroll down to where, roughly where we are. We're in the final chapter on the book going through that. And last week we were talking about how the different marriage books and DVDs and seminars are deceiving people. And they're running these gimmicks, which are these marketing schemes to try to teach people a, a line of garbage that's basically they're going to repeat themselves over and over but they don't really have understanding of these things and over the years I've had to delete all of that stuff that I read from my mind and start over fresh again with the Word of God because the information in those books turned out to be useless when it came to my own marriage when you when I finally I said okay I've studied this forever then when I get into marriage I was like this is all useless this is not helping me at all and I turn to the Bible to learn the philosophy of Christ. That's why we wanted to start out um, solid on marriage on that when Lorraine and I started out. And they were, again, the Bible was teaching charity, which means that charity, once you understand the full concept of that, which again, what is it that Jesus said in, in Matthew 7 12? He says, Whatsoever men should do unto you, do, un, do you also unto them. For this is the law and prophets, meaning that this is the fulfillment of the law and prophets. So when everybody says, you know, the. The world says, oh, the golden rule is you treat others the way you want to be treated. Well, that's where that comes from, okay? And what again, that amazes me that you have these atheists, and I have debated them myself online. I've listened to others. When What they'll do is they'll come along and, and just, they said, well, we don't need the Bible. We don't need anything. We should just, you know, and I said, well, how should we operate? Where do you get morals come from? Well, you should treat others the way you want to be treated. I've heard them say that before. And I'm thinking to myself, you hypocrite. I was like, you are denouncing the word of God, but then when it comes to morals, you have nowhere else to turn, but exactly to the word of God. You're denouncing Jesus with your mouth, but then preaching him with your mouth and, and in doing so in your willful ignorance. It blows my mind that they do that, but again, it's willful ignorance and they don't want to understand charity. So charity, uh, that's the fulfillment of that. It's being able to think of another person before yourself, to think of what others are doing, think on the things of others before ourselves. And with a foundational concept of charity, which again, when I'm talking, we're talking about the virtues of, you know, honesty, humility, and hardworkingness, all that is centered around charity. That's what it is. So if charity is the foundational philosophy of your marriage, any conflict in marriage can be solved. If the husband and the wife judge themselves in righteous judgment, and they practice that honesty, the humility, the hard work. And so you don't need a thousand gimmicks, you know, of all these different marriage books. And I'm, I'm talking thousands of hours of this stuff. As 1 Corinthians 11, 31 says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So the first thing we should do in any marriage is to look inwardly. I know the other person. Well, the other person did this. The other person did that. I know. But look inwardly first. The first thing we have to judge is, am I doing that? Number one. And it doesn't matter either side, man or woman, you have to look at, you have to judge yourself the same way. And in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, and prove your own selves. We're supposed to prove that. He says, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So, I mean, you have to look inwardly first. We're supposed to be examining ourselves. It's not that we're not supposed to be judging others and judging the world and judging, I mean, again, the Bible says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, but we're supposed to be judging inwardly first. And again, the word judge means to compare facts or ideas. You're taking ideas and facts and you're comparing them to see what's true and what's not and perceive their agreement or disagreement and thus to distinguish truth from falsehood. So when you have the people go around and say, don't judge me, you shouldn't judge anyone. They're saying, don't tell me that I'm saying something that's not true. How dare you? How dare you look for the truth in things? Don't look for the truth in anything. Just accept whatever false thing I tell you. That's essentially what they're doing. And not understanding that, that judging is to discern a matter. We want judges in a courtroom to discern a matter, especially if we've had done, wrong done to us. Well, why would we not want to judge righteous judgment as well? 
And the word discern means to see or understand the difference, to make distinctions between good and evil from truth and falsehood. We're supposed to do those things. And that's why when, and I guess I, I might mention this later, this verse later in Amos chapter 5, when you've got a lot of these people, I mean, the Jews, in Amos chapter 5, this is the days of the Jews, remember? Same thing's going on today. They would go into the temples. They would do all the religious traditions that they were supposed to do. You go in, you sit here, you bow at this, and then you, you pray for this amount of time, and then you come up and you take this or whatever it is, right? They're doing all the religious traditions. but And then they would sing their songs. And in Amos chapter 5, he clearly says, take away from me the noise of thy songs. Take away from me the melody of thy vials. He says, I'm not going to hear them. He says, when you lift up holy hands, he says, I'm not going to see. He says, but rather let righteous judgment pour down as a mighty stream. That's what he said to do. So he wants us to be able to judge righteous judgment and to judge ourselves the same way because the Jews were going into the temple doing all the religious nonsense. Not, it wasn't nonsense, don't misunderstand. These were the commandments that God gave them. But it became nonsense because why are you doing it? If you don't have a repentant heart, what's the point? What is the point of doing all this religious stuff? What does it make you feel better? It doesn't repair anything. There's no reconciliation with God because God judges the heart. And the heart is showing whether somebody has godly sorrow in their heart. And he's looking at that. So we might as well be overly, abundantly, obviously honest when we come in prayer to God. There's no reason to stand on pretense because he sees it all anyway. So what's the point of trying to put on a show for errors in front of God? What do you think? You're fooling him? It doesn't matter. So he says, pour down that righteous judgment. He says, first do that, then go sing your songs. But don't come in singing songs like a lot of people do. Even this morning, there's church buildings all over the place where they're just singing their songs and then they go back to their daily lives and change nothing. And that's because, you know, just like we were talking about earlier, the obedience is not there because the four, core foundation of repentance is not there. That's why they don't do works meet for repentance because there's no <laughs> repentance there in the first place. And they don't, uh, or it's either that or they believe in a false Jesus. They don't believe in the Christian God of the Bible. They don't follow his word. If you remember the scripture where it says, if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. People quote that over and over. Well, if you read before that, he says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. They always miss reading that verse beforehand because that doesn't include everyone. And so they don't like that very much. But again, Hebrews 5.14 says, Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So this is something you have to practice. It's something you have to be given from the Holy Spirit of God, but then you have to practice it as well and get good at it. You have to get better at it. Which is why when you have new Christians that come in, they're not very good at discerning those things, which ones that have been around longer, it's easier for them to do it. And Isaiah 5.20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe unto them that do those things. They call these things that are actually not good, they call them good. These are the great things. We're going to bring them into our homes and all the church buildings and whatever when they're really not good. They put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And woe is calamity, curses, distresses that they're bringing upon themselves because they're calling the things that are good evil and the things that are evil good. So if the husband's not judging himself, getting back to the marriage, or the wife is not judging herself, the problem is really easy to identify from a third party perspective. When you're not personally involved, it's way easier to tell a lot of times. I've, when I've counseled other couples, I've seen that in their marriages. However, in most cases I've seen, there are problems with both the husband and the wife not judging themselves properly at the same time, okay? Now to varying degrees. Don't misunderstand. It's not always equal 50-50, although there are many instances in which it is. Sometimes it's 60-40. Sometimes it's 90-10. I've seen that too. But again, in most cases, the prob there's problems on both sides. And even though you might believe that you're only 10% of the problem, you have to judge yourself enough to the point and judge it as if your 10% might be causing 90% of the problem. And, there, and I know that <laughs> seems like, wow, that's... Difficult math. Okay, don't worry about it. But it's, it could be. That 10% may be causing something that's causing the other 90%. So we need to judge ourselves first. Let's get that clean. When Jesus talked about the hypocrites that are judging in unrighteousness, you have to clean out the beam out of thine own eye before you can get the splinter out of somebody else's, is what he was saying. So this is not to say that you can't judge somebody else in what they're doing, but clean out yourself first. 
So anyway, if both parties would judge themselves in honest and righteous judgment, they wouldn't have any need for marriage counseling in the first place. What, what's the point? And so this becomes the primary problem with hiring a marriage counselor or going to marriage books for help. Because again, if you remember in earlier parts of this teaching, we talked about the hypocrisy of the online dating websites and things like that. Because it, again, I talked about this before, when your company's stated goal contradicts your bottom line, and again, your bottom line is your profit, how you make money, it's a scam. It might be a legal scam, but it's a scam, okay? And so when the online dating websites, if you remember right, they say, we wanna help bring together people with their soulmates, which is, that's a load of garbage too, but they said, we wanna bring people together and have them get married. No, you don't, because if you did, you wouldn't make any money. People would not pay for your service anymore. There's no point. So you see, the point is, is that they don't really want people to get together. They only want a few of them to get together to have enough testimonies to advertise their business and make it look good. Now, the same thing you have to think about with marriage counselors. Because the faster you solve your marriage, the less money they make. So their bottom line is contradicting their stated goal. And so the counselor only makes money if you're having a problem in your marriage. And this is not to say that all counselors are scamming you, don't misunderstand, okay? But we have to acknowledge that solving your marriage and all the problems in your marriage is not a goal that aligns with their financial interest, okay? And for that reason, that might be part of the reason why they've got so many books, they've got so many DVDs, they've got so many things to sell you because they are taking, and, and essentially, folks, if you ever decide to get into it, I'm not saying you can't read them. I mean, I'm not here to tell you what to do in your house. I'm simply warning you. But if you want to go buy tons of their books, pay careful attention to them because you're going to see their gimmick repeated over and over and over and over again to the point that you're going to wonder why you spent all the money on these. Because, I mean, essentially, once you've read a, a couple chapters into one of their books, you've basically read all their books. But they're just going to keep telling you stories to keep you interested. Okay, they want to they want to definitely get all those uh, heart-tugging stories that makes you want to keep reading. Because all you're really looking for is stories. You're not actually getting help for your marriage. So, I'm not saying it's wrong either to seek counsel, to seek help. All right, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. It's good to seek wise counsel. Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And Proverbs 12.15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So it's good to go seek counsel from other people. It's good to get help. But we have to be cautious of what kind of help we're going to, okay? That's the discernment and the judgment that we have to use. So the help that you should be seeking, number one, should be from someone that stands firm on the foundation of God's word. Because under that circumstance, then you're going to have, okay, the goal of the counselor is to be obedient unto Christ. And therefore, your successful marriage and the counselor's philosophy are going to align. Your way of thinking is going to align, which is good, okay? Now, I'm, I'm like, I, like I said before, I wrote this and I'm, I did this teaching for Christians. I did not do this for the world because the world, yeah, they're going to need marriage license. They're going to need to pay all these counselors and these therapists and the psychologists and all, you know, which is a pseudoscience that's not real science. They're going to need to go to all these places because they have no other choice. But those who are of Christ should go to those who are of Christ to get that same philosophy because that's the only thing that's gonna fix anything. Although I would recommend that you find someone who does not charge you a fee just to be on the safe side, okay? Because then you start to get into problems if you do that. And there's plenty of people out there, I'm, at least I think there's plenty of Christians that are more than willing to help and not charge anybody thing for, anything for it. I've never charged any, anybody for any, any help like that. So I don't know why uh, others have to either unless of course they're trying to justify their psychology degree because they're trying to teach people a bunch of new age garbage That's not biblical which they often do and we'll, when I do the psychology teaching we'll get into more of that But if they're trying to justify their what the two hundred thousand dollars they spent on a degree Oh, well, yeah, maybe then that's why they're charging you money because they also want to pay that off and they want to drive a BMW and They have those things are expensive. Somebody's got to pay for them so anyway 
few marriage counselors understand the basic philosophy of scripture that I'm teaching. That's why I'm not giving you gimmicks. I'm just telling you the basic understanding of these things that applies to everything. That's why you don't see in the Bible, oh, wow, okay, here's the scriptures that list out the five love languages or, or the 10 things to help improve your marriage. That's why the Bible does not do that. It teaches the basic philosophy, the basic way of thinking you need to have when you enter into marriage. And so it's not that they lack intellect. I'm not saying that these people who, these counselors are, you know, they, they're, they're not intelligent to a certain degree, but the problem is, is that they're intelligent in the ways of the world and they lack the Holy Spirit to open their eyes so they can understand. Because it's not possible for them to fully understand the things that I've taught in, these, in the series unless they've been given the gifts of wisdom and understanding from the Holy Ghost, right? Because the things that I've said that have helped anyone in this, it's not because of my wisdom, it's because of God. It's because of his word. I didn't learn these things because I'm super smart. I'm, I'm your average idiot. I, didn't, I don't know anything. And, and so I have to be given those gifts. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man, which that who has not been saved, who's not been regenerated, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They're spiritually discerned. You can't know them. So going to some worldly psychologist or counselor is not going to help you. They'll never figure these things out. So let's talk about some examples. And I'm going to give some stuff that's happened in my own experience. I am going to talk about some things that's happened between Lorraine and I as well. And she knows that I'm going to talk about these things she's fully aware, okay? I'm not saying any of these things to embarrass Lorraine or myself or anything like that. It's just that I have to give examples of what I know, okay, of what I've experienced. And so, but when I got started, okay, I found that most of the books I read on marriage were addressing things from the wife's perspective. This happens all the time. And this was a trap I fell into when I was studying on dating and marriage and relationships and all that. And, and please don't misunderstand, and ladies specifically, do not misunderstand. It's not wrong or it's not unimportant to understand a woman's perspective in marriage because it is going to be different. It's not wrong. But did God create man for woman or did he create woman for man? I mean, which one is it? So God created woman for man, which means if we're trying to understand the philosophy of marriage, because without a woman, there is no marriage, right? So if we want to understand the philosophy of marriage, if we want to understand why women were created, why are they the way they are? Why do they do things the way they do? Why do we, why? We need to start by understanding men. Because women is the counterpart of that. So we need to understand men first. And so in previous parts of this teaching, I addressed the fact that marriage itself doesn't make any sense outside of scripture. Because again, you have to ask the questions, what is marriage? We, we, I mean, that's, that's the thing that it's like, okay, you know, the young couple gets married, they go to this preacher and they're like, oh, okay, you got to arrange all this stuff. And they're doing all the traditions. They do all their pagan rituals and everything like that, right? When does ever once they sit down and say, what is marriage? If, if those of you who are married, think back to when you got married. When did you sit down and ask yourself what it was? You just kind of go along with it. And a lot of times it's like you have, you've got preachers, you've got parents, you've got all that, that just simply go along with everything they're taught and never once think about this stuff. Never. Why? Why <laughs> never? Well, because the point is, is that, and a lot of it, when you're, even when you're a teenager, a lot of the stuff that you see going on in your parents' home doesn't make any sense and nobody's explaining it. Nobody's saying any of these things. And eventually you get old enough, they're getting more and more irritated, not understanding these things. And eventually you get old enough that your adulthood is just staring you right in the face and you're like, I've got to do something. So I'm just going to go along with what they did because I don't know what else to do. And then the same cycle keeps repeating. When are we going to stop this? And that's just sit down and have a basic understanding of these things. So there's no other worldview in the world that can account for marriage like the Bible does. No other worldview, no other religi religious sense. Nobody can really account for these things because it doesn't make any sense. They can't explain why two people should remain together for life. What's the point? So again, what is marriage? How is marriage different from two people just living together? 
why are the couple considered to be one person in unison? Why does that happen? Even from a legal standpoint, for people who get the marriage license, it's still considered that way, even though the contract doesn't say that from behind the scenes. If you go back to earlier parts of this teaching, you get more details on that. But why is there so much pressure from our society for the two people to remain together their entire lives? Now, of course, there's a lot less now than there used to be, but there is. And there's many countries where it's, it's a different level of that. But yeah, why is there so much pressure for them to remain together for their entire lives? Where does dating end and marriage begin, according to the world? Is it a piece of paper? Is it a contract you sign? When, when, when does that, you see, these, these questions are, you know, let's even get more simple. Why, again, why are women the way they are? Why are they different from men? When did this happen? Again, if you go to the world and you go to, you know, you take away all of scripture, you go to their false doctrines of evolutionism, which is a religion of its own, and you think about these things, none of it makes sense. None of it which is why so many of them are not getting married anymore. And I showed you the charts on that earlier. And so, I mean, these questions cannot be logically answered. And consistently, it's not just, you know, okay, we're trying to reason something out. There's no, there's no consistency either without the Word of God. You have to have the Bible to answer these things, otherwise they don't make sense. So if we want to understand marriage, we need to understand what Adam needed. What did the first man need? which led to God creating a woman for him, which led to creating marriage. Okay. Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now, that is a very specific term, and it's one that when I was looking, because I, I looked into this very, very carefully. I was studying every word I could find, trying to understand the definitions of them. And again, going back to the 1828 dictionary, Noah Webster's dictionary, because he based all of his definitions contextually on the King James Bible. And the word meat, and there's, it's very interesting how the word is, because when you look at it how, it, how it actually is structured, meat means it's qualified to a use or purpose, and help is one who gives assistance. So a help meet is a person who is designed with specific qualifications for the express purpose of serving men. It's really strange, but that's exactly what it is. And we say it's strange, it's only because we're so many thousands of years removed from when this happened. Because when it happened, I'm sure it wouldn't have been strange, it's just natural. You just flow right into that. Because God designed them to do these things. So it's to be a companion and help for him. Now this is not saying that every single woman needs to get married or every single man needs to get married. Some, I mean, many are given that, others are not. And scripture talks about that too. There are some that are not given the gift where you know they really have this desire to be married and that's fine. But you'll find that those single women still find ways to help men. They still do, they find these ways to do that because that is fulfilling to them. And that's because they were designed originally to do that. Now, I don't care if some women out there which are, you know, have this feminist philosophy get all offended by that. I don't care. The fact is that God created females for that express purpose. Now, if you want to deny that, you're going to be miserable your whole life. That's a, if you want to live your life in misery, that's up to you. I, that doesn't, what, again, what people do in their household is none of my business. But if we're going to understand women, we're going to understand wives, then we first need to understand men and husbands. And because of the feminist type society that we live in today, people are missing this point. Because women were made for men. They can rage all about that if they want, but these are the facts. So a lot of the leavened authors that I was mentioning last week before we got done, they most often start with the female perspective. And they write for female readers. You can tell that they're doing this too because they know they're going to make more money if they do it because if they target women, women are the ones that make those purchases far more often than men do. So even the way they're writing them, what they're structuring is designed to make money. It is not designed to help your marriage. Okay. If they help somebody's marriage along the way, they're like, well, that's a bonus because then I can put on another good review and make more money. <laughs> the cycle continues, okay? And of course, they're gonna tell you that's not their intentions. What, okay, whatever. My point is, is that if you follow the money and you look at the bottom line, again, there's contradictions. So 
again, I'm going to say it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't look at the woman's perspective, but these books are written to target women to make money because they more often purchase them. Which is why, if you look at these series, why do they have a book that's written specifically for men? They make this gimmick book, okay, then they make the same gimmick for men. Why wasn't the first one for men too? I thought this was supposed to be, you know, fixing marriage collectively. Why do you need to make a special one for men? Because they didn't write that for men, you see? And that's the whole, the whole point. So they're designed for marketing purposes, not for marriage. So the point I'm making is if we look at marriages and relationships from the woman's perspective, before looking at it from the man's perspective, we're gonna end up with a lot of confusion. And sadly, due to the influence of the feminist propaganda, our society attempts to look at these things in the opposite way scripture teaches us to look at them. And that's why there's so many people who are confused. And again, I have a book called Feminism Castrating America that you can read. Just type in, go to creationliberty.com, type in the word feminism, F-E-M-I-N-I-S-M, and that'll get you to that book. Again, it's free to read online. So as I've said before, I fell into this trap of spending all my time trying to understand women. I, I really wanted to because I could not do it, right? And I had a hard time. And I, at the time, too, I hadn't really uh, dated or anything that much or, or that that sort of thing. And um, I wasn't really attractive to women. And I didn't understand why. I didn't understand what I needed. And I didn't have any of the things that I needed that I know now that I need. And if you guys, if, if men out there want to know uh, what you need, again, I highly recommend that feminism book because there's a, a chapter, I think it's chapter six in that book. It's called The Biblical Role of Men. And I go into that in much more detail. I'm not going to go into that a lot right now. But what, but I have covered in previous you know parts of this teaching some of those issues I've covered in those in the feminism teaching and we went over a lot of that stuff. But I was trying to learn what women wanted, and the problem was is that I was going to the world to get this because the pro okay television shows and radio and all this stuff they give an idea of what they say women want from women who don't really know what they want. And I, you can laugh at that all you want, but these are the facts. These women are of the world, and so they're looking at the materialism, they're looking at these types of things, and they think they understand what they want when they're not looking at what Scripture says that they actually want. And so they become confused. And so when you go in the world and, and you have these men that get irritated, it's like, these women just don't seem to know what they want. And I was like, that's because, yeah, they kind of don't, because they're looking in the wrong direction. And so what I was doing, I was trying to learn how women react, what women typically do, how they think, how they feel, but it didn't make any sense. And that's where I was talking about, I don't know if I mentioned that last week, I think it was one of the, like the Mars and Venus books when I was reading those. There was one time I threw it against the wall and I said, no, like that didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I mean, I picked it back up later, but I needed a break for like three days from that, from doing any of that because that didn't make any sense. It was like... The, what they were talking about there, basically the essential idea was, it was like, okay, the woman is communicating in this strange way, in this foreign language, by innuendo and all this other stuff, and the conclusion was, well, they're just that way, so you just have to get used to it. And that's when I threw the book against the wall. I said, that doesn't make any sense. And when I later started studying scripture more, that's why it, it didn't make any sense to me. And that's why I was irritated by it. I didn't understand, because again, go back to First Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. But when you have received the things of the Spirit of God, and those things are not making sense, I was then, now at that moment, I reacted as a child, okay? I did, that. I, I almost never get like that, but that point, it was so irritating to me. And then I realized, wait a second, when I started studying scripture years and years later, it's not like that. The problem is, is the women that are being described in those books are not women of understanding. And there was the issue. I couldn't figure that out. But you see, I was putting my trust into those worldly people with their psychological degrees and all that. And that, that's why they, it wasn't consistent. And that's what I was talking about earlier, of answering these things in a consistent manner. So I was only learning the female reaction outside of the understanding of the male. And I wasn't taught the things of men. I mean, I grew up, I mean, because there's some people that's like, well, Chris, why are you trying so much to understand? You're saying you don't understand the male perspective. You're a man, right? Well, yeah, 
But when I was raised at home and, and spent time in school and spent time in the church buildings we went to and spent time in our society, they didn't teach me the male perspective because most of that is mainstream media that's teaching feminism and what these wicked women claim that they want. So now I'm getting only, I was like, okay, well, this is what these desires, like they're, okay, all men are evil. That's what I'm being taught. And uh, men are not to be believed. Men are all liars and things like that. I was like, well, then I've got something to prove here. I'm not like that. And then I went out trying to prove that. And then I, because of that, I got taken advantage of, I got abused, I got used. There's all sorts of stuff that happened because of that. And if I had understood the things that I've been teaching in these teachings back then, I wouldn't have gone through a bunch of that. But who was there to teach me? And, and again, this is that, that process that keeps happening. These young men keep growing up. Nobody is teaching them anything. And then when eventually they get old enough, they've got to make decisions. And they're like, I don't have a choice. We're just going to have to go along with it. And they don't understand what they're getting involved in. They don't understand how they should be choosing a woman to marry. They just go with what they've got and go with their feelings. And going with your feelings, that's kind of like the, the worst thing you could possibly do because that's going to get you in the most trouble. So all I was being taught and what I was witnessing in dating and marriage were two different things, okay? Again, what I was learning about marriage came from mainly two sources, my own family and the media. My family didn't teach me much, and I understand that there's many of them in this room, so I'm trying to be careful with what I say because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but they didn't teach me much because there was a lot of hatred back then in my family, and there was a lot of standing on pretense, and they were also plagued by the feminist philosophy. And the media didn't teach me much because, well, they don't teach much of anything. They teach sinful doctrines. They teach the lust of the flesh. What am I going to learn from them? What am I going to learn from the school? The same thing the media is teaching. And so, I mean, I didn't have anybody to teach me what men are supposed to do, how they're supposed to think, what, how we're supposed to act, what our responsibilities are. I was taught nothing while at the same time being automatically expected to know everything. See, because men and, and, and women, you don't get treated like this when you're young. Boys do. If you don't understand a thing or don't go along with something that's being done, you are kicked until you do. That's the way you're treated. Most young, young men are not being guided to the place they need to go. I mean, which, what, how does, does a horse respond better to guidance or spurs? And so, but, but young boys are just being, having the spurs put to them. You know, you don't do that. The pressure of all the other young men are like, <laughs> you're an idiot. And you get made fun of, you get called a bunch of names, you get kicked around when you're not doing what's right. I'm, you know, I'm glad you women don't have to go through that world, but you don't know what it's like to have to go through that. Now, men do need to suffer that to a certain degree, okay? That's why if there's a man who's reacting to some woman, he's being aggressive with her and she doesn't want her on him. That's why another man will come up to him and beat the tar out of him because men need that sometimes. Boys have to be taught to be rougher. They're, they're raised to be tough. That's their, that's their purpose. That's their job. Okay. But at the same time, a little guidance might go a long way into helping giving them understanding to let them know what they have to do. So not only did I not know anything about what I was supposed to be doing. Everyone else around me acted like they already knew everything, but that was a facade because it wasn't until decades later I figured out, wait a second, they didn't know anything either, but they acted like they did and made fun of me for not knowing anything because I was the only one willing to say, hey, I don't understand any of this. And because I was willing to be honest, they're like, well, let's kick him around so we don't have to think about it. That's exactly what was going on. And then and these, all you guys are laughing because you're like, wait a second, that's kind of how I experienced things too. Yeah, but, but eventually you just went along with it because what else do you do? Without the wisdom of God, we won't know what to do. So none of them know, knew what they were doing. So how can somebody who doesn't know what they're doing teach somebody else to do that? It's kind of like the concept of homeschooling is where you know you have a lot of people and I've heard this many many times where they'll say, well, you know, if I don't, if I don't send my children to public school, how will they learn social skills? From other five-year-olds? You're telling me that seven-year-olds can teach your children social skills? How, how is that going to happen? I mean, I heard a testimony from a lady just the other day in a video where she was talking about that going into a public school system, she says you're, you're essentially putting your children, you, you know, take your 10-year-old, you're putting him into a class with a bunch of other 10-year-olds. Now go into society, where does that happen? 
Where do you get put into situations where everybody is exactly your same age and is going exactly through the same things you're going through? You don't. So she, she was raising a family of like nine children and they were all different ages. And she says, that's the way it should be done because then you start learning a bunch of things from a bunch of different perspectives, learn how to handle a lot of different situations, learn that you're not the only person in the world. There's some older than you, some younger than you, some have different needs. And you start learning way more than you would have in a public school system that teaches you one singular thing. And that singular thing is not how the world works, which is why you have, I mean, you wonder why you have so many unruly teenagers nowadays. They're being taught the wrong things, and they have no idea how, what to do once they actually get out into the world, which all of you who grew up in the public school system and graduated from there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, I get, sorry, I'm getting a little worked up on that because I went through that, and it's just, it's so irritating that when is this cycle going to end? So, what does all this have to do with marriage? A lot, okay, actually, because we're getting to that. But as a child, I remember I was struggling to understand the contradictions that I saw in marriage and relationships because I had no answers. And as I grew, there came a point in my adulthood, again, it's staring me in the face. I just have to accept everything I saw and heard, go with the flow. I didn't know any better, but this is what I had to do. So I went through the motions without understanding what I was doing. And that led me through a lot of sin, a lot of heartache, a lot of afflictions I could have avoided very easily if I had a fraction of this understanding now. And so after I spent a lot of time in God's word, after I considered my own experiences in relation to what God has told us in his word, that I learned that by understanding men and God's role for men, I would automatically understand women. It's very easy to understand women after that point. And I would encourage women to do the same thing. You want to understand yourself? Understand God's purpose and role for men first, because that's the structure in which he created everything. So trying to study women first is kind of like being dropped from a helicopter into the middle of the Pacific Ocean without any tools or direction and saying, okay, go find land. <laughs> and that's kind of what, you're, what you end up doing and expecting to find your way home alive. It's nonstop confusion and suffering, and eventually you're going to drown if you start in the wrong spot. But if both men and women first study God's role for husbands, then they're automatically going to learn and understand God's role for wives, and everything's going to fit in and make sense. And not only, I mean, because you understand what a help meet means, and then men should understand what the word husband means. Because husband, the word husband actually means a good manager. It's what the word essentially means. You make good management, one who makes good management decisions. That's what you're supposed to do. So again, these things are going to be automatic if you do that instead of doing them backwards like the world does. So I'm just going through my notes here, but the marriage counselor, the DVDs, the books, the seminars, they often talk about love in a marriage or how to have a loving relationship. And it's deceptive when they say those things because they're actually using the new age definition of love, which is based on emotional attachment. It's not based on, okay, here's the biblical definition of love, which as I pointed out in earlier parts of this teaching, that's it. love is a selfless sacrifice. That's why you don't see, you know, when people go around and they expect to, oh, my parents need to tell me that I, uh, you know, that they love me or something. They say, oh, I love you so much and things like that. The Bible never uses that phrase in that way ever. And the reason for that is because how can you selfless sacrifice someone so much? Because that's not what they mean by love. They're talking about the warm, gooey feelings. Okay, that's what they're referring to. That's not what the Bible refers to. That love is a selfless sacrifice. When... For example, John 3.16 is very famous. A lot of people know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So, it says, so God so loved the world. People say, oh, God just thinks we're the best. He has that warm, gooey feeling about us inside. That is not what that's saying. He made a selfless sacrifice. And the Bible says if he was willing to give his own son, what, what will he withhold from you? <laughs> He'll give you everything. And so, but it's not that warm, gooey feeling. That's not what's being talked about here. So when they talk about it in the marriage DVDs and all that, that's what they're referring to. And so they're trying to point couples to make them have more warm, gooey feelings, which is not the problem. That, that's not, a lack of that is not the problem. See, what they're trying to do is say, well, you know that infatuation we had when we met, we just need to re-spark that. No, 
No, that is not, because that infatuation is lust. That's not love. Love is for the parents, and I use this example because it's a good one, I think, is getting up in the morning and having to change that baby's icky diaper. You don't do it because they're like, oh, I just love changing diapers. I can't wait to get up and do this again. It's a selfless sacrifice. That's love, okay? And the people who don't love their children won't do that, okay? And so the thing is, I mean, because it's the kind of thing, and I hate to use these examples, but you've had some of these absolutely disgusting, wicked women who have taken their newborn baby and thrown them in a dumpster and left them to die, which has happened many times. I, we've seen that uh, in the news and that sort of thing. The, the people says, how could someone do that? Why didn't they love their child? They think, where was the attachment? Whether there was an attachment or not, where was the actual selfless sacrifice? And that's, that's the problem, is that there's no charity. And there's no charity because, again, really what Jesus Christ has to do is regenerate us. And John chapter 15, starting in verse 12, says, This is the commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. So he says, if you remember my commandments, because remember he says in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. What's the love of God? 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Well, wait a second. I thought love was the warm, gooey feeling that they're talking about. No, love is a selfless sacrifice. To keep the commandments of God is a selfless thing. We might feel like doing one thing, but we do another thing because he told us to do that. And that selfless sacrifice, that's love right there. And that's why when you see people doing works meet for repentance, they're expressing that love and they're showing that they're actual disciples. They're proving their own selves, right? And so... God's commandments for husbands and wives are very simple, but rarely taught properly, even though they're simple. Church buildings don't teach them properly, at least from what I've seen, they don't. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. And we need to go into details on this stuff too. Because we need to really gain a full understanding of these. When it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, that means it's, it's submission to that is to their authority. Because they said that is, the Bible says that's fit. That pleases God. That's according to his will. It says, husbands, love your wives. So you're to make selfless sacrifices for them. They submit to your authority and you make selfless sacrifice. And it says, and be not bitter against them. Why doesn't it mention bitterness from the woman to the man, but the man to the woman? Because often there are times where the women want their way, <laughs> but at the same time, he has the authority. So what ends up happening? Sometimes they step on that authority. And that really, without that authority, what do men have? Because men have to serve. They have to give everything. The Bible teaches them that as Christ gave everything to the church, he sacrificed himself. So men are commanded to sacrifice and give everything as well. All their money, their time, their everything, they're supposed to be giving and sacrifice to that. So if they're loving them properly, they're doing that. What else do they have but authority? Because without that, they're nothing but just, you know, dirt to be trodden over, really. So God gave them that one thing. He says, you're going to serve them. You're going to be the lowest in the family, but at the same time be the highest in authority. It's very interesting how that works. But... And that's why he says, don't be bitter against them. Even when they get, they step over that, forgive them. Don't be bitter against them. Don't hold that grudge in your heart. And at the same time, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. As you would do things for yourself, do for her. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. That word very particular is used very few times in scripture. What that essentially means is that you would treat him as if you would treat a king. And that king then turns around and gives his everything to her. It's a perfect union. It's a perfect harmony when it works well. But working well is kind of the struggle. It's like everybody has to give at the same time. If there's only one person giving, it causes a lot of problems. But again, bitterness is sharpness 
cruel, cruelty, severeness, hurtfulness, distressfulness, any of that, the pain that's experienced, those kind of things, don't be cruel and mean and severe to her. Because as a, a husband ought not to say and do things that would cause his wife distress, which he's going to treat her in a cruel and hurtful manner. There's tears of grief that are good unto the Lord. That's that godly sorrow. But there's also tears of grief that are caused by the malice of a husband. And we're commanded to make selfless sacrifices for our wives, not to mistreat her in any way that would cause her pain of mind and body. And on the other hand, women are also given that extra commandment that is different from men, which is to submit to them and give reverence to them. And again, reverence is fear mixed with respect and esteem, which is to val highly value and uh, submission is to lower or yield or surrender to authority. And so a wife should not be lifting herself up in her pride as if she's a queen to be served in which she treats the husband as if you know she's entitled to his service. And there's times where a wife needs to be straightforward with her husband. I understand that. There's times where you have to be direct, but never with an abusive or demanding attitude. Women are commanded to lower themselves under the authority of the husband who cares for her, which, by the way, is part of the obedience unto Christ. And again, that sort of thing I've talked about in, in previous different teachings where that's also an example to the church. It's an example to the world as well, because the Bible makes the, the correlating reference of the marriage between the husband and wife of Christ to the church. So the way a man treats his wife gives an example of how Christ should treat the church, how Christ sacrifices and Christ gives and Christ forgives and Christ is understanding. Whereas as the woman, how she treats her husband is an example to the world and to the rest of the church, how they should treat Christ, how they should be submissive to that, how they should be loving and giving and kind and understanding. And so, I mean, if you see, for example, and I may mention this again later, if I go through my notes, I might be getting ahead of myself, but if you see how there's so many women today that treat their husbands in a way as if she's entitled and she deserves more privilege because of the feminist type qualities that, that the world's being taught. And when these women act like this toward their husband, is it any wonder why we see church buildings treating Christ the same way? They don't care about his word. They don't care about his commandments. They just do whatever they want to make themselves feel better when you see a lot of women treating their husbands that way. It's very interesting when you see men not making those selfless sacrifices for their wives that you see how people do not get a good impression of what Christ does, the faithlessness that they have in him to trust him for those things. So all of us bear responsibility for even teaching Christ unto others through our very marriages. It's that important. And so when the husband and the wife are honest with themselves and each other, they both humble themselves toward one another and they both work hard to serve one another and they make selfless sacrifices on each other's behalf. And when they do that, any problem can be solved. What problem would you have that could not be solved if both parties are doing that? Any pain can be healed. Any burned bridge can be rebuilt. Any burned bridge can be rebuilt with hard work. Okay, It's lies pride and laziness that rips marriages apart. It's the selfishness, not the selflessness. And in earlier chapters of the book, and we were covering this on these teachings, it's what Jesus called the hardness of heart. That's what it says in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 4, it says, and they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement. And again, there is no bill of marriage. There's a bill of divorcement, though. And to part her away, and Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. And the hardness of heart, again, is a heart that is filled with pride and sin. That's exactly how that's defined. So the three virtues that I was talking about, the honesty, the humility, the hard work, they have to be applied together. You can't just do one. You have to do all of them. Or it's not going to bring about any change or reconciliation. Being humble without facing the truth, all that does is it makes a person timid and cowardly. It doesn't really make them humble. There's a big difference between timidness and humility. Huge difference. And so being humble without facing the truth just makes a person timid. It makes them cowardly. And being honest without being humble makes a person cruel and arrogant. Right? You see those people that go around, they'll say something that's true, but they do so without humility. And you see that person, they're like, oh, they're so mean. I know. That's how they do that. And meanwhile, if a person is lazy throughout the entire process, being unwilling to make a sacrifice 
to sacrifice time and resources into another person, then honesty and humility, no matter how much you have, it's going to mean nothing because then there's no charity. Charity takes work. <laughs> charity takes the effort. So there's no love if there's no charity. Because love and charity are not necessarily defined as the same thing, but again, they go hand in glove. So because in order to make a selfless sacrifice, which is love, that's charities involved. So the whole thing happens at the same time. All right? And in my own experience as the man of my household, I worked from the first day of my marriage to make sure we upheld honesty as a foundation for everything we said and did. Now I had some improvements of my own I had to make, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I grew up in a household when I was growing up in my family, it, the, it was based on a lot of assumptions and a lot of standing on pretense in the household I grew up in. That was a miserable experience for me because nothing was ever explained. We were expected to do a lot of things but never explained why we were doing them. And it just, it was so miserable. And I wanted my household to be extremely honest, openly honest about everything. If there's a feeling, you feel a certain way, you're thinking a certain thing, let's just be honest about everything. And in order to do that, we needed to have something that most people call arguments or fights because that's what's going to happen. And they call them fights, married couples like to do that, but they're, they're arguments, okay? So to help understand this a little better, I'm going to share an argument that Lorraine and I had one time. And to preface the story, what had happened is Lorraine had elected, and, and many of you know if you've listened, been listening for a long time, she started up a, a garden to sell fruits and vegetables. She has a full farm that she works on here. And I am a full-time author and teacher of scripture. So I work a lot in my office on my computer while she's outside working on the farm. So I have, obviously, more stable work hours that allows me a bit more freedom that she has because of what she chose to do. Now, keep in mind, her and I had a long discussion before she started this, and I warned her what she, she was going to have to do this. I said, you realize you're going to have to be up real early in the morning, and you're going to be working late nights sometimes, and it's going to be rough. And she was like, oh, yeah, I know. And, and you know, she's like, I'm going to do that. Sometimes she has to be up before dawn. And that often results in her being up and working before I get up and I start researching and writing. So at the time the incident I'm going to describe here, Lorraine was in the middle of a lot of heavy work season, which is usually right around hmm, now, now-ish in the year. You know, we're talking about July, August. This is where she gets really irritated. She gets really tired. And when her business was in its infant stages, there was so, I mean, there's a lot to do, but it's so much harder to do it in infant stages because you're not seeing all the reward for your work yet. And so there, you, you don't feel as much respite when you, when you have that paycheck coming at the, at the end of the week. Um, it causes a lot of problems because it's just it's hard to deal with. So you, you have to be faithful while you're doing those things. But there was a lot of stress on her because of her long work hours. She had to build up everything she needed for the farm, which is something she chose to do. And I agreed to help support her while she did it. But I warned her. I said, I am not going to be your personal farmhand. I have my own work to do. Now, I do help her, and I help her on a daily basis. But I help her with other little things, stuff that she needs. I am Lorraine's biggest investor, so I have poured a lot into what she's doing. And I did for some, sometimes what I would do is I'd be writing and working all day, and I would come out for a couple hours and just haul weeds for her. <laughs> she would pick in weeds, and I would just go out there and haul for her. So I was helping her at the beginning before she got some, some work to help out. But she came into my office one day, and she was really stressed and agitated about her work. And so I listened to her frustrations, and I knew that's what she was doing. When she came in and did that, I knew that's what she was going to do, so I just listened. After a few minutes, she started getting really overly emotional, and I knew this was a problem, but I was just trying to wait and see how this went. And so I know that she gets in that mood. Sometimes she's going to say things she's going to regret. Now, just to preface this, we need to be careful with what we say. Okay, the Bible teaches that over and over. James 1.26 says, If any man, any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. Bridle means to restrain. Bridling, like bridling a horse is where you put reins on the horse. You put reins on your tongue is what you're supposed to do. But deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. That means if you believe, claim to believe all the things that Jesus is talking about, but don't put restraints on your tongue. This is not to say that you'll never make an error or mess up because it happens. Okay, but... Because no man is flawless, but we're to live perfect, which means living perfectly means that you're supposed to live according to that which we are intended. 
okay? It doesn't mean that you're going to be flawless, but it means that you need to take these things seriously. But, that, but religion is vain. To claim all this religious stuff about the Lord Jesus Christ is total vanity. That means it's useless if you don't control your tongue, control what comes out of your mouth. And Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. And this was talking about the days of the temple where they would go in and they, were, they didn't want to listen to what was going on and take that rebuke and, and bring themselves into a subjection of repentance. But he says, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. It doesn't mean you can't talk, but it means that we need to listen to these things, especially when it comes to God's word. So at one point, Lorraine, in her fury, she says, I don't get to lay around sleeping in bed all day. And then she, when she said that, she gestured to the bed that I sleep in. And that set me off. That angered me because I work every day. On this ministry and what I'm doing, I'm working every day on this and I work many long hours to do a lot of this writing I am writing multiple books every year and releasing them for free it is it, it's a lot of work to do all this stuff and through the emotional state of her heart at that point she was implying that I was lazy and slept while she was out working hard and that made me angry because I was investing a lot of money and time and everything. So I tolerated her emotional state for a time and I listened to her until she said that. And so I immediately stopped her rant and addressed her on what she just said. And she insisted at that point she never said it. And some of you are thinking, well, how can someone not remember something they just said 10 seconds ago? She was in such emotional rage, her tongue was unrestrained by her reason and she didn't even stop to consider what was coming out of her mouth before she said it. Now, a few days later, she would come to admit that she didn't remember saying it at first because she was so enraged. But in the heat of the moment, she would not confess that she ever said anything because she was still heated at that time. Now, most marriage books and DVDs and seminars are going to tell you that, hey, you know, as a man, try to be understanding with her and just let it go. Have you guys ever heard that from any marriage counselors? You've ever heard that sort of thing? That is not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible teaches. I wasn't going to let that go. No. Because it's not a biblical resolution to just let it go. When what she said was a lie, and it was very insulting. Was, was she reverencing her husband at that point? No. It was an insult that was designed to try and make me as upset as she was at the time. Which actually was deceptive on top of it. Now, of course, she did. I'm not saying she was realizing she was doing that actively at the time. But that's what happens when we let emotion take over reason. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Because the Jews were so concerned about what they were eating. Well, well, should I eat this or should I eat this? What's religiously the right thing to do? And we're forgetting, look, the main point is what's coming out of your mouth. That's the issue. So the Lord Jesus Christ told us that the words that we speak come from the heart. And people says, you can't judge me. You don't know what's in a man's heart. Yeah, we do. If you just listen to what he says, you know exactly what's in his heart. So even when things are said in an emotional rage, we're going to be judged for those things. So if you ignore that from somebody else, like from a spouse, you're ignoring the sin that's in their heart. And when sins are left unchecked in the heart without addressing the problem and resolving it, it defiles a man. And so in marriage, do you want your spouse to be defiled? Do you want them to be corrupt inwardly? Or do you want to address that? Because whether it comes from the mouth of the husband or the wife, it doesn't matter. These things should not be ignored because God's not going to ignore them either. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said that every idle word a man shall speak. That's even an idle time when you're not even serious. How much more... Are we going to be judged for the serious things that we say? They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Everything you say. So, Jesus takes our words very seriously, does he not? So should we take our words very seriously? Yeah. So, 
we should first judge ourselves for every word that we say. And if we're not judging ourselves, then we have no place to judge anyone else until we judge what comes out of our mouths first. But if we judge ourselves first, then we can see clearly to judge others. And that's what I was mentioning earlier from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. Thou hypocrite, and again, a hypocrite is someone that puts on a false outward appearance, tries to look good on the outside, but inwardly there's a problem. He says, first cast the beam, that's like this giant log, out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the moat, which is like a tiny speck of wood, out of thy brother's eye. So once we've judged our own words, if we're charitable to our spouse, then we're going to address them on those things that are spoken wrongfully, deceptively, or in error. And then they might come to repentance of their sin and bridle their tongues, which God will bless them for doing those things. And so they might hate us at the time for doing that. And I can tell you, I have been on the receiving end of a lot of rage from my wife, especially, most especially in the early years of our marriage. Not so much anymore, because it's taken a lot of work. And those of, those of you who've looked at our marriage and say, oh, you and Lorraine, you work so well together, you guys get along so well together, and they think all that, that has been through a lot of tears, a lot of hard work, and a lot of arguments that have had, had to be made. And so we had to address the philosophy of what we were saying and doing. We had to address, and it took one of us at least, to address them calmly. We had to calm down. One of us has to be calm and rational for the sake of the other one at the very least, because that's, a, that's also a selfless sacrifice. You're taking that heat to try to calm them down and to reason with them. So they will be reconciled to God, that he would not judge them strictly for the sins of their mouth. So even that, to address the problems there, is going to do a lot of things, okay? I'm gonna talk about this more because we're gonna to have to end this pretty soon, uh, just a minute here. But the problem is that Lorraine had, when she came into the room talking, was not that I was lazy. She didn't think that for a second. That wasn't the truth. It was that she was jealous. I knew that. And I told her that at the time and she just kept denying it, denying it. But I told her, I was like, you were jealous that I got to work more stable hours that didn't require me to wake up as early as she did. Even though she chose that path, and we talked about this beforehand, I, she knew she would have to do these things. I warned her about it. No one forced her to start a business. I didn't force it on her. She knew this is what she was going to have to do to make it successful. Jealousy was not a reason to lie and accuse her husband of being lazy. And the way in which she approached the subject was deceitful because instead of being direct and just directly accusing me of being lazy, she insisted on doing it in a roundabout way, just kind of ambiguously gesturing to a certain thing and saying something that's kind of, you know, going around this, which is kind of the way women tend to communicate, if we'll put communication in quotations there, instead of just being direct. And she was hoping that I wouldn't catch what she said. She knows better than that. I will always catch what she says very quickly. <laughs> Um, and yeah, she knows me better than that, but I called her out on her words. We'll end here in just a moment. I just want to finish this up telling this, but I called her out on her words. She denied that she said it, which was a lie. And so I went to her address on two lies now. And she continued to deny everything else I was telling her after that point, because she was so heated. She got even more heated after I addressed her on those things. And again, the marriage books are going to tell you, well, you know, it's just kind of calm everything down. Just make it. No, no, no. We have to address the truth. Peace is not peace if it's based on a lie. Peace is automatic if everybody accepts the truth, then there's no problem. But at that point, I told her, I said, get out of my office. And she stormed out. And this fight went on for days. <laughs> we Now, and people said, well, I thought the Bible says not, don't let the sun go down in your anger. I didn't. I calmed myself down and I didn't let it go. But I said, I'm not letting this one go because folks, Forgiveness with, without repentance is a one-sided relationship. And that's what the marriage books won't teach you. Almost none of them will. Is that if you're, if there's no sorrow for a wrongdoing, but you're handing out forgiveness, that's a one-sided relationship. Why do you think God doesn't do that? Because it's a one-sided relationship. <laughs> there's nobody else involved. And so if you forgive something that is a core problem, a lie or sin like that, and you forgive that and let that go, Guess what happens the next time that thought comes up? The lie will continue and the fight will happen again and again 
and again for years and decades to come and you wonder why things get built up more and more and more until the point that they get divorced or they murder each other. That's why is because they never address it at its source. And that's what we're going to continue talking about, addressing things at their source. We'll continue on with that next week. Next week we'll go into that, uh, about the women just being that way. No, that's not the case. And that the absence of fighting is not automatically evidence of peace, okay? Silence is not evidence of peace. And we're going to, we're going to show the difference between these things. We'll continue on talking about that next week. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close? All right, well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week. And may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him in all that you say and do. And God willing, we will see you next week.